Well, I'm not trying to make any enemies with this opening statement. But I'll give it the caveat that this is personal opinion and not gospel truth. But when I reflect on my life and I look back at the category of most foolish but not sinful, but you know, it's its own category because most foolish things are sinful. But there are some foolish things that I wouldn't quite call sinful. When I think through that category in my life, what's the most foolish but not sinful thing that I've ever done? I think it's when I bought a PC when I could have bought a MacBook. It's, it's, it's just the way that it is. And it's not just so you can know the extent of my foolishness. It's not that I would have liked a MacBook, but I couldn't afford it, so I got a PC, a PC. No, I could have afforded whatever I wanted. I was fresh out of graduating high school with all my graduation money to go get whatever I thought would get me through college, and I chose poorly. And uh, by the senior year of college, I was really feeling that because I'm looking across the room at my roommate who bought, who chose wisely and bought a MacBook. And, you know, his is working just fine while mine sounds like a 747 trying to take off when I'm just trying to check an email. And and then one of my uh, best friends, well, he has a brand new one. And I'm looking at that like, oh, man, well, what did I do? And then, thankfully, I graduated and I went to my first job after college. And there sitting on my desk for me the first day of work was a MacBook. And I have never looked back since, right? I put that, sorry if this is offensive, piece of junk computer that I had bought deep in my closet, right? And used the new thing. And I've never looked back since. Now, you might vehemently disagree with my opinion on that. But I bet most of us have had some kind of experience in life like that where you got something that you thought was good and over time you started to realize it's really not what I thought it was. It's really not what it was cracked up to be. It's it's not. And then you got something new and you got something better and you have never looked back since. We we know that experience and what that experience it's a little taste. It's, it's a similar taste. It doesn't begin to compare in magnitude to what we're going to see today. Because Paul is going to talk about what he used to have and, and how he thought it was so good. But then he learned that it wasn't and he got something better and he has never looked back. And that's important for us to see as we think through the Christian life, but it's also critical for some of you probably here in this room this morning because you need to realize you're still holding on to the old thing. And it's time to realize it's, it's not what it claims to be. It's not what you thought it was. Give it up. Throw it in the trash where it belongs and look at what Jesus is offering. Well, we're going to see this today. I want to invite you to take your Bibles now and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we'll be looking mostly today at verses 7 through 11, uh, but we were trying to get through Philippians 3, 1 through 11 before uh, Christmas, but God had other plans. We had to spend one extra week there, so we want to finish that up today, and, and it's concluding this section where Paul has shifted gears in the book of Philippians, and he is trying to give them a serious warning about false teaching. And he's warning them against those who would falsely try to add works or to add ceremony and tradition to the good news of Jesus Christ. Very specifically, those who would try to add circumcision to the gospel. You must be circumcised in order to be really saved. And what we're going to see today is the conclusion to that section. But let's read the whole section one more time as we get into God's word this morning. Philippians 3, let's start in verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. So that's where we stopped before Christmas with Paul reviewing his spiritual resume, all the things that, especially in that culture, would have made him look so good spiritually. And now we get to today, verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So as we look at this, right, we start there with Paul saying that idea, but whatever gain I had. Now there, very specifically, it seems that he is referring to his spiritual resume there in verses four through six. All the things that, especially in a first century Jewish culture, somebody would have looked at and said, well, if anybody's going to heaven, it must be that guy. And that's kind of what Paul says in verse 4. He's basically saying, hey, if you want to play this game of righteousness by works and tradition, I have you all beat. Because look at all the things that I have done. And then in verse 7, Paul is saying, but I took my spiritual resume and I tore it up and I threw it in the trash because I need something that only Jesus can give. And then in verse 8, he goes on to say, Indeed, I count everything. And I think here he's expanding on what he said in the previous verse. He's not just talking about his spiritual resume, but everything and everything that could have come along with that. Paul could have lived a comfortable, very prestigious, powerful, wealthy life in Jerusalem if he had wanted to. But he's saying, no, all the things that could have come along with that, all the comforts and pleasures of the world and the power of position, I'd give it all up. And note the beauty of what he gives it up for, how he puts it there in verse 8. For the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because I have come to know Jesus, the Messiah. He's my Lord. And that is way better than anything else, is what he is saying. Therefore, he's been willing to suffer the loss. Right? That's not an easy thing. Suffer, loss. Uh, He's letting everything else go and even count them as rubbish. Sometimes that word referred to dung, but could also sometimes refer to the trash that was thrown out and meant to be sifted through by the dogs of society. Perhaps a a parting shot at the dogs Paul calls out in verse 2. He's saying, it's all scraps to throw to the dogs. Everything else I had, everything else is worthless compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Point number one this morning, you need to see everything in your life as worthless compared to Christ. See everything in your life as worthless compared to to Christ. And when you listen to, to Paul's language here in, in Philippians 3, it, it starts to s- sound like you're in an accounting class and you're listening to someone talk about their profit and loss statement because of how much he uses the word gain, which was a financial word, and how much he uses the word loss. And he's saying, I, I, I'm moving a bunch of stuff I thought was in the gain, the profit column, and I'm moving it over to the loss column because they're all loss compared to to Christ. And another thing that I think we would see to be true is they're all loss without Christ. If you try to have any of those things without Christ, it will not work. And so let's start, if you're thinking more about your life now than Paul's, let's start where he starts in verse 7, I think, specifically referring back to his spiritual resume. 
You need to look at your own spiritual resume, all the things you would think of that that look good about you, all the things that would maybe make you worthy of, of salvation or better than other people, and you need to learn to see that as worthless. You need to learn to see that as something that should be ripped up and thrown in the trash. Now, again, we talked more about this last time we were in Philippians. Uh, Most of you aren't tempted to think that uh, your spiritual resume is impressive because you're Jewish or you've been circumcised. But there's a whole lot of things that maybe Americans, what we would like to put on our spiritual resume. The idea, well, I, I think I'm better than most other people I know or I see in this world. Or, hey, look at me. I I go to church. Or, hey, I do a lot to serve the community. I I have a pretty strong family. It seems like my kids are sticking on the straight and narrow. That's got to count for something, right? Or, or I'm a conservative defending, aren't those biblical values? Or, I haven't done any of the big sins, so that's, that's better than other people. That makes me worthy, right? No, the Bible is teaching us none of that means anything because you are still lost without Christ. And that's why one of the things, the phrases that we used earlier in this chapter was you need to see Christ as a gurney and not a crutch. You don't need to say, well, you know, my my resume is pretty good, but it's probably not quite enough. So, hey, Jesus, come, come and help me out with a little extra that I can't do. It's coming to see, no, I am dead, I am lost, and there is zero hope for me unless Jesus comes and gives me not a little bit, but everything. Have you come to see that about yourself? I want you to think even of the passage that we read earlier in the service, Matthew 5, 3, which if you have been reading through uh, the gospel of Matthew with us, you, you see how it's set up. Matthew's main point is Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, speaking probably to a more Jewish audience. And so he uses a lot of Old Testament quotations to show Jesus is the Christ, which he and every one of his readers would have understood means Jesus is the King. And that is so clear in these opening chapters. And then you get to Matthew chapter 5 and it's clear the King is now going to speak. The king is going to give his manifesto. Hey, this is what life in my kingdom, this is what life for my people looks like. And where did Jesus start, if you remember from Matthew 5, verse 3? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does that mean? It's basically saying, blessed are those who know I've got nothing without Christ. I am spiritually bankrupt and destitute without Christ. It's much worse for the people that think, ah, I've got something. I'm pretty good. No, no, no. Those aren't the blessed people who are inheriting the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit who know they've got nothing without Christ. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 64, 6 puts it this way. All of our righteousness is like filthy rag. Right? All of our righteousness is polluted. It is corrupt. And the, the sooner you come to see that, the better off you will be in Christ. And even there's a connection, I think, between poor and spirit. Well, what's the connection there with just those who are poor? Because in Luke, doesn't it just say, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Well, I think there's at least some connection there because it's often easier for those who don't have very much in the world to admit that they've got nothing when it comes to, Uh, to their spiritual resume, where it can be harder. Even Jesus says it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because when you, when by this world standards, it seems like you've got it all together. You know, you're paying the bills, you're even somewhat prosperous, and you think of yourself as a good person. When you're in that situation, which is probably like all of us in the room, it's harder to admit, I've got nothing. And I need a savior. I need rescue from the destruction that I am in. And we need to see Christ as a gurney, not a crutch. Have you come to see that? Have you come to take your spiritual resume, throw it in the trash and say, no, my goodness, or what I think of as goodness, doesn't count for anything. It's it's polluted. It's rotten. I need a savior. Today needs to be the day that you come to realize that. And then next, in verse 8, he goes on to talk about 
everything, all right? And going on now, let's think about everything in life. And there are some good things God has created in this world to be enjoyed, but it is all lost compared to Christ, and it's all lost without Christ. You need to really believe that knowing Jesus is better than anything else in this world. It's certainly better than sin and self. Knowing Jesus is better than going out and doing what you want and following your own flesh and your own desires. And you, maybe if you've been at church long enough, you're like, yeah, I, I know that. Well, knowing Jesus is better than comfort or pleasure because uh, Paul, he gave up a lot of that to follow Christ. And he taught people it's through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Are you ready to give up comfort and pleasure for the sake? Nope, knowing Jesus is better. Or think about this. These are some of the best things to enjoy, good things in this world. But knowing Jesus is better than friends and family. Right? Those can be precious gifts of God. But knowing Jesus is better. Because if you try to have friendship or you try to have family without Christ, good luck with that. It's not going to work out well. Or if you value those things more than Christ, sometimes following Christ means that there's going to be sacrifices in family or friendship because of Christ. And Paul is saying he's better than all of it because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And we've already seen this idea from Paul. Go back with me to chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And there's another verse where he says this so so beautifully, showing that he valued Christ more than life itself. Philippians 1, verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. My life is all about Jesus. And it really is, we're putting it with this series, this series, Jesus is the treasure that I'm after. And so to live is, is all about him. Not family, not reputation, not career success. It's about Jesus. And because of that, to die is gain. Because guess what I get when I die? Fully Jesus. I get to go and be with him. Paul has made it clear. Jesus is the treasure that I am chasing after. Can you say that? Can you say that he is the treasure that your life is centered around? Can you say to live for me is Christ? Even what is church about to you? Is it, well, when I go to church, I feel better about myself? Or when I go to church, I learn some good lessons? Or, you know, my, my kids probably need to learn this, so church is going to help me have a stronger family? Or is it, no, Jesus is the treasure, and the church is the body of Christ, so you better believe that's where I'm going to be. Because th that's where the treasure is going to be, with the body of Christ. And I want more of that. Uh, one parable we look at often, we looked at it when we looked at Philippians 1, 21, is found in Matthew 13, 44, which tells the, uh, the parable of the treasure hidden in the field. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he, is, that he has and buys that field. In some way, that's like a story form of what Paul is saying has happened in his life. Guys, I found a treasure and I got rid of everything else to go and get this treasure because it's, it's worth it. I don't regret anything about what I've given up because the treasure is that valuable, the treasure of Jesus Christ. And that even helps us make sense of statements that might seem hard or harsh in, in the Gospels. Consider the words of Christ himself in Luke 14, where he says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And that is a strong statement, one that uh, bears some reflection. Uh, have you been willing to say, I renounce everything for the sake of Christ? Give me Jesus, I'll let go of everything else. Because Jesus says, that's what you've got to do to be my disciple. And you may have to leave behind some things that are precious to you. But when you consider it in light of Matthew 13, it makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? I'll gladly renounce all else because what I'm gaining is a treasure that is way more valuable than anything I'm leaving behind. 
And so if you aren't really a follower of Christ, if you've never reached that point in your life where you're willing to let go of the things in your life that are keeping you from Christ, it's not merely a matter of, well, you're not hardcore enough or you're not trying hard enough. It's that you don't fully understand Jesus and you haven't really been able to see him for the treasure that he is. Because if you know him, if you've seen him, then you will say, yep, get rid of everything and give me Jesus. That's what Paul is describing for us here. And that's why he's willing to suffer loss, which suffer loss is what it sounds like. It it doesn't feel like a good thing. Suffer loss. But he's saying it's worth it when I get to know Christ. Or counting things, even what the world would consider good things, as rubbish or dung. I, I give it all up to treasure Jesus Christ. And that's what, if you're a Christian here today, if you're a part of this church, that's what needs to be the beating heart of our church. We treasure Jesus more than anything else. And that's why we do what we do. Just even think about some of the basics of the Christian life. Why should we study the Bible? Why should we pray? Why should we fellowship? Why should we evangelize? Because Jesus is the treasure and he's more valuable than anything else. So I want to mine more out of the word to understand Jesus better and see him clear. And I want to share him with others. That should be what we do if we really believe that Jesus is more valuable than anything else. That's what the Bible teaches us right here in this passage. Now, I've been talking so much about how Christ is valuable. It's only fair that I explain some, and the Bible explains some of, well, why is Christ so valuable? And thankfully, Paul elaborates going on in the next three verses. Let's put this down for point number two, cherish what only Jesus gives. So if if I'm to value Jesus, what is it that he Gives and, and as we think about what Jesus gives, I want to use three words, which sometimes as Christians we need to be a little more self-aware, especially in evangelism, where we just start using really churchy words that other people won't understand. And if we're being honest, sometimes how we use them, we're showing we don't even understand it. But these are three good words that he goes then, even verse by verse, discussing each one of them, justification, sanctification, glorification, Right? Uh, That is uh, kind of what we move through as Christians. Justification is the moment you are saved. You are justified. You are declared righteous. Sanctification, well, it's something that kind of happens over your Christian life as you progressively grow more and more like Christ to be set apart. It's the idea of sanctified, set apart to be like Christ. And then glorification, that's what happens at the end. When we die or when Jesus comes back, we experience what it's like to be glorified with Christ. And in the next three verses, one verse at a time, Paul is going to talk more in depth about each of these. Let's start in verse 9 with justification. Justification. Paul's saying, I'm giving up everything else at the end of verse 8, that I may gain Christ. Okay, well, what about him? Verse 9, and be found in him. So he's talking about something positional. I want to be found in Jesus Christ. And then he sets up a contrast in the rest of the verse, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So he's saying there's two avenues to righteousness. One revolves around me and the works of the law. The other is really the righteousness of God, and it depends on faith. And he's saying one of those avenues works and the other one doesn't. The avenue of me and my own works and my own righteousness does not work. But the avenue of God's righteousness through Christ received by faith, that's how you get found in Christ. That is how you can be justified. Let's look at another passage where Paul goes into this more in depth. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 3. Now, we've looked at some of the earlier parts of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 2, even earlier in this passage in Philippians. And we see Romans chapter 1 kind of aims at the the, the pagans and godless of the world, saying, look how the wrath of God is revealed against them. Chapter 2 pivots to, hey, you uh, uh, religious people, don't you do the same things? knowing the law or being circumcised isn't going to get you anywhere when you still are sinning. 
And then chapter 3 gets to no one is righteous. Let's pick it up in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So hey, this, this way of righteousness, it is closed. You're not getting anywhere with your own righteousness through works. No human being will be justified that way. Verse 21, but. Man, Philippians 3, 7, Romans 3, 21. There are some great contrasting conjunctions in the Bible for you grammar nerds out there. These are two of them we're looking at today. But. Now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Right? This way is closed. This way is wide open. It's the only way. The only way that you are going to be saved is through the righteousness of Christ, not your own. And how do we receive it? By faith. Well, how, how does that even work? How can my sin be dealt with? Well, he goes on to explain that Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation or atoning sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So how can my sin be paid for through what Christ did as a free gift? Well, it's making it clear it's not just swept under the rug. No, your sin is paid for by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So God is still just, punishing sin, but also the justifier, forgiving you and me. And it's all through faith in Christ. And he goes on to explain that more in chapter 4 when he goes back to Abraham, which this fits in with our discussion about circumcision in Philippians 3. Hey guys, even Abraham wasn't saved because he was circumcised. He was saved because he had faith, because he believed God. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 1, and what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's another accounting term, right? Abraham believed God, and boop, there's a credit in your account. What is it? The perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is now yours because you have believed in God. Christ. In some ways, it is a transaction. It's it's a trade. Jesus gets all of your sin and its punishment. You get all of Jesus's righteousness. Now, kind of from Jesus's perspective, it sounds like a a trade maybe you experienced growing up, all the older siblings in the room. I'm talking to you. I'm a younger sibling, but older siblings, you know, those deals you would try to pass off on your younger siblings— I see the looks of guilt on you older siblings' faces right now. You know you're guilty because you know you were, uh, you know, when you were young, you had your basketball cards and, hey, little brother, that's a nice Michael Jordan hologram you got there. Hey, this is a really cool Dikembe Mutombo card. Want to trade? Sure, big brother, right? Bad deal, right? From God's perspective, this, this looks like a bad deal. He's, Jesus is getting all your sin and punishment, and you're getting all of his righteousness, and it's a great deal for us. And God is saying, this is the gift that I am giving you. And it, you don't receive it through your works. You receive it by believing God. I believe God. I believe what he says and I do think at the heart of that believing is a really, I believe Jesus is who he says he is. I believe Jesus is the treasure that he claims to be. And that's why I, my spiritual resume, paired up, 
I don't need that. I need the righteousness Christ can give. Trying to earn it myself? Nope, can't do it. But Jesus is giving it to me for free. That's the way that you can be justified. And if you've never known that, today needs to be the day. That you say, I can't do it on my own. I can't earn my own righteousness. God is offering it to me for free. And I'm tearing up my spiritual resume and all that goes with it to say, give me Jesus and the righteousness that only he can bring. And this, because it's based on Christ and what he has done, is one of the reasons why I think true assurance is only possible for real Christians. Go share your faith, talk to people that aren't Christians or ascribe to some other worldview or some other religion. And when you ask them the question, well, how sure are you that you're going to heaven? You're rarely ever going to get someone that says 100%. Usually at best, it's, well, I hope so. Why? Because to some extent, it's based on them and how good they're doing and their works. Where biblical Christianity is unique, where I can say, no, I am sure, 100% sure, because it's not up to me, ultimately. My righteousness was given to me by Jesus Christ in full. So I have assurance. That's why we sing things like, when he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Because if there's any of your righteousness still left in there, right, if it's not his righteousness alone, there's going to be some fault to find. But when we are dressed in the righteousness of Christ alone, we stand faultless before the throne of God. That only can come from Jesus. So again, if you think being a good person or if you think coming to church can save you, throw that junk in the garbage today for the sake of the gift of Christ. That's what you need to do. But it's so clear for Paul that it doesn't end there. It's not sweet. I got my justification. Now I'm just going to kick up my heels until heaven. Uh, no, there, there's something about this life that's, that's not just good to him, that's sweet to him, that is part of this surpassing value. And, and that's really this idea of sanctification, becoming more like Christ in this life. And we see more about that back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where he says that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So there he uses a couple words to say, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing what Christ is experiencing, one that I may know him. I, I want to know Christ. I want to know what he's gone through, and I want to share. I want to have fellowship with his sufferings. And he uses two things that you might not think go together, because the one thing he wants to know is the power of his resurrection. But the other thing that he wants to share is his sufferings and even talking about becoming like him in his death. Well, if you want to experience sanctification, if you want to experience becoming like Christ, get ready for that combination. The the, the suffering and pain with the renewal and the resurrection power working in your life. Ephesians 1.19 states very clearly that for believers... The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in you who believe. Do you believe that? Are you ready to head into another week with the resurrection power of Christ at work in your life? And one of the reasons why you might even hesitate is, well, in our human perspective, sometimes we think, well, if I had resurrection power, I'm just kind of skipping across the waves through life and everything is good and great all the time. Resurrection power, oh yeah. But it doesn't always feel like that. Because a lot of my experience feels more like the suffering. And that's where we forget that the the resurrection power and the suffering are going to go together. And and what is that death? What is sharing the sufferings of Christ and the death of Christ going to look like? Well, the New Testament shows us a variety of things. One thing, if we were to go back to Romans chapter 6, Paul reaches a hypothetical question that's valid. If you're tracking, it's a free gift by grace. Well, if it's a free gift by grace, why don't I just like, Sin a lot more so that more grace, yay! Uh, No, that's not how it works, Paul says. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, he anticipates that question, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So this death with Christ starts with your relationship with sin. And you are now dead to sin. And then now again, uh, how does that work out in the Christian life? Well, that's maybe easier said than done. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Sometimes saying no to your sin feels like dying. But it's saying when we, when we experience that, when we die to our sin with Christ, we experience this resurrection power to live, as it says there, to walk in newness of life. Jesus died so that you would walk in newness of life, that now your perspective has changed. You realize, no, sin is death and destruction. Righteousness is life. I don't want to go back to the old junk anymore. Give me more of the good stuff that I can only get through Christ. That's going to feel like dying and then experiencing that resurrection power. Turn with me to another passage uh, in John 12, 24. And this is during Passion Week, the week of Jesus' death and resurrection. And he's anticipating those events, which is why in John 12, 23, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he's speaking of the events later that week, even uh, including his crucifixion. That He didn't see any separation between his crucifixion and his glorification. That was part of it. And he goes on to explain, hey, Christians, you've got to see it that way too. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So here, Jesus is clearly first and foremost speaking about himself. Even this whole grain of wheat, he's talking about himself. He has to die so that through his death, much fruit can be born. But then he very clearly goes on to say, hey, you want to be one of my followers, you should expect to go through that same pattern. Your life is not going to bear fruit unless you first, like a grain of wheat, fall into the earth and die. Now, what does that look like? We've already seen one way was through death to sin. But if we were to consider, add the writings of the apostle Paul to what Jesus says here, we would see many other ways this is true. What we see this in the context of suffering in ministry, and spiritual battles. We see that so much in the Apostle Paul, or even the emotional turmoil that comes. You want to be fruitful for the kingdom? You want to see other people get saved? You want to see other people grow? Get ready to suffer, because it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of emotional turmoil invested. There's going to be a lot drained out of you to see that happen. You better get ready for that sacrifice. And another thing clearly we see from Paul, and we can't ignore with the context of Philippians 3, being Paul, a prisoner in a Roman jail, not sure if he's going to make it out alive. Certainly another thing he's speaking of is persecution and even martyrdom, which becoming like Christ in his death, the ultimate way of that is dying like a martyr, like Jesus did, which is what Paul will eventually do. But Paul is saying, hey, you want to experience the resurrection? Get ready to experience the sufferings too, but that's the way it is designed and that's the way that it is good. The, the rest of your Christian life, it's a continual series of Good Fridays and Resurrection Sundays. And I don't mean on the calendar, I mean in your life where you are dying to something and then experiencing the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Paul explains this very beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you just jot down that reference, that's where he talks about this thorn in the flesh that was harassing him and how he pleaded with God multiple times for it to be removed. But the Lord said to him, he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you want to experience the power of Christ in your life this week? Then get ready to be weak. That's how it works. When we are weak, then he is strong. 
He goes on to say, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's how this works. The sanctification, sharing in Christ's suffering, and sharing in his resurrection. You die to yourself, and you find, wow, once again, Christ is sufficient. And I'm growing to see he's more sufficient than I ever dreamed he could be. Or as one old preacher put it, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Christians should have a unique perspective on suffering because we don't just view it as some evil in this world. We view it as something that brings us closer to the Christ. To Christ, I'm good with the suffering because it brings me closer to the treasure. And that's what I want. That's the attitude that we are to have based on this passage in Scripture. And as we think through those things, the Good Friday and the suffering and, and, and the, the Resurrection Sunday and the power there, well, guess what? One of those things is eventually going to go away. And that's the suffering part, the death part. Because someday, sanctification will be done and we'll experience glorification. And if you go back to Philippians 3, that's what we see there in verse 11. Paul, I think in verse 10, clearly speaks of the power of his resurrection in, in this life. But in verse 11, he's clearly looking towards the future, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And the Bible clearly teaches that if you are a believer, if you are found in Christ, then you will experience a literal resurrection like Jesus did. The Bible speaks of it in a couple other passages. When Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. They'll have a physical resurrection. And those of us, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, we won't all sleep. We won't all die. Some of us, if we're alive when Christ comes back, we'll be changed, right? We'll meet them in the air and we'll experience this resurrection body that Christ experienced, a new body, a glorified body. And we'll talk more about that in a few weeks because in Philippians 3, if you look at verses 20 and 21, it says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So we'll get more in depth on that in a couple weeks. But one thing I'd like to address back in verse 11 is this idea that says, where he says that by any means possible. What does he mean by that? Because at face value, it almost seems like Paul's, well, if it works out, uh, but that can't be what he means, right? That, that seems to fly in the face of everything else Paul says, which gives us the attitude of blessed assurance and confidence. No, I will be with Christ. And I think the best explanation of what he means by that is that it's more of a humble amazement. It's more of the idea that, that by any means possible, I can't believe that I will attain to the resurrection from the dead. You guys remember Saul of Tarsus, that guy? He's going to experience the resurrection from the dead. Can you believe this stuff, right? And it's all through Jesus Christ. That day of glorification will be a great day, but it's going to be a unique experience. You think about any other accomplishment in your life, whether it was a graduation or a, an award that you received or some kind of accomplishment you made in, in your career, uh, right? There's always other people that you're thankful for in those moments, at least there should be. Uh, but there's also some sense of, well, hey, man, I feel gratified. All my hard work paid off, right? Glorification is going to be unique because it's not going to be, yeah, I did it. It's going to be, man, Jesus did it all. And all the glory goes to him. I am here 0% because of myself and my accomplishment and my works and 100% because of Jesus and his righteousness and I have been found in him. And that's the treasure I would trade anything for. Right? That's what we're gonna experience on that day. So I hope as we conclude this section, Philippians 3, 1 through 11, we, we don't miss that heartbeat of it all, that there is no treasure like Jesus. We should take our spiritual resumes. We should take anything we value in this world and throw it behind us to gain Christ. And there will be no looking back. Let's pray together. Father, help us to grasp 
the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Help us to not lose sight of what a treasure that is. God, I pray for those here today or or listening online, God, that have maybe never come to truly see that. God, would you please open up their eyes? Would you help them to see that whatever it is they're holding on to in this world, whether it's some semblance of a a sense of their own self-righteousness or whether it's some sin that they don't want to let go or or some priority that that, that will never, in their minds, take a second place to you, God. Help them to see that all of that is garbage compared to knowing Christ. God, help people to see that and help your people here never to lose sight of that. We live in a world that is so distracting. And God, we have so many responsibilities and and life can get hectic and crazy and help us never to lose sight that to live is Christ. God, may we never take good things in this life and put them in the, the place of the best, knowing that only knowing Christ belongs there. And may that be the heartbeat of everything we do in this life. God, that we live to serve Christ because he is the treasure. So may the name of Jesus Christ be exalted this morning in our midst. And all God's people said, amen.